Welcome to this fourth in a series of global webinars here at Carter Murray, each addressing the challenges across various sectors in the current market conditions. Thank you to those who are joining the, the call wherever you are. You may or may not be aware that Carter Murray is a specialist marketing recruitment agency, part of the wider SR group, covering marketing, communications, business development and digital roles across professional services, financial services and commerce and industry. We have offices in London, Frankfurt, UK, uh, sorry, Hong Kong, Singapore, Sydney and New York. Today, we are so very fortunate to have such an impressive panel of leading marketing and business development experts discussing the impact of cur the current crisis on marketing strategy, tactics, people management, and also career advice for the future of professional services, business development, and marketing professionals. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Leo Franks. Uh, thank you, Leo, for, for taking part. Uh, he's the current CMO of Augusta Ventures. Leo has extensive global knowledge, experience, and insight within professional services marketing, having led marketing in Europe, Middle East, and uh, Africa at FDR Consulting, EY, and previously Deloitte. Thank you to all of the panel as well uh, for taking the time today and sharing your insights. I hope you all enjoy the webinar and much uh, and, and sort of find out uh, to, to much of value to you. So over to you, Leo. Thank you very much indeed, Hannah. Good morning, everyone. It's really great to be here. And thank you to Carter Murray for the kind invitation. As Hannah said, I'm Leo Franks uh, and, and Hannah's mentioned the firms I've worked for. I also now chair the marketing committee for the professional services industry body the managing partners forum which is all about networking with people in the bd marketing and comm space so in that context i'm really delighted to be joined today by a really strong panel of seasoned bd and marketing comms leaders to talk about how their functions have changed over the past few months and importantly to give us some insight on their views about what the future holds so we have five speakers, each of whom who have led teams across the professional services industry, and I'll introduce them in a moment. But briefly, the webinar today, which is being recorded, has three elements, several polls, which I will pose to the audience throughout the, uh, the affair. Uh, secondly, some pre-prepared questions for the panel, uh, five of them. The first one on strategy, talking about the big picture. Secondly, about tactics, looking at the specific marketing comms investments that have worked for people over the last few months. Thirdly, on people managing and leading teams. Fourthly, on learning how we've all developed and how we're seeking to advance ourselves during this difficult time. And finally, some careers advice for everyone on the call, some words and wisdom from the senior panel that we have today. If time allows, I'll also ask for questions from the audience. And if you'd like to put a question forward, at the bottom of your screen, you, you should see a Q&A button. You can click on that at any point. Please submit your questions through that. If you don't mind mentioning your name, you don't have to, but if you could, I will reference your name when we ask the question. And uh, we'll do this on a first come first serve basis. So please get your questions in early. So that's the agenda. Let me start with uh, an introduction of each of our five panelists. Firstly, we have Alessandra Almeida-Jones who's Director of Marketing at Baker McKenzie. She has deep experience across law firms at Baker's, Linklater's and Kingwood and Mallison's. Secondly, we have Emma Baker, who's Head of Marketing Comms at the law firm Charles Russell Speechless. A lot of experience in legal at Freshfields and many years experience in financial services marketing as well. Thirdly, Chris Pullen, who is the Legal Business Development Leader for EY and sits within their financial services industry group. Uh, Chris previously headed marketing teams for three top US law firms and a consulting firm. Next, we have Peter Thomas, who is the Chief Marketing Officer for the multinational consulting firm Accenture across Europe. Peter leads a wide range of brand and marketing comms activity and has had a varied career, including as Director of Comms for the Rugby Football Union, from which time I'm sure he has a story or two to share. And finally, Amanda Wadey, who is Head of Practice Development for the leading law firm RPC. Amanda is headed marketing uh, at law firms and legal services. And she's also, from memory, a reformed litigation lawyer. So perhaps one for the other panelists not to argue with on today's call. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. 
So that's the panel. And before we get to the questions, I'd very much like to put our first poll to the, the audience. Uh, so if we could ask for the poll to come up. If you're watching on recording, unfortunately, you won't be able to see the graphics of the poll, but I will talk through both the questions and the answers. So this is a simple demographic survey. We're asking the, uh, the audience, everyone, please, to choose the functional area that you feel best summarizes where you sit in your career today. And there are five options. The first is business development. The second is communications. The third is marketing. Or fourthly, you could say you're in an integrated role. All of the above are covered by your role. Or fifthly, you could say none of the above. So if I could ask everyone quickly to pick the functional area that you feel best describes where you sit today, and just commit, uh, uh, click on the submit button at the bottom of the screen. I see quite a few people are voting. We'll give you a few more seconds before we close the poll and ask for the results to go on screen. Just a couple more seconds. Okay, thank you very much. Could we please poll, uh, close the poll? Right. Wow, okay, some very clear results. Again, for those watching on recording, you won't be able to see, but I will I'll summarize. 41% of the audience identifies being in business development, only 3% in communications, 18% in marketing. Pleasingly, 37%, over a third, would say they're an integrated role, and only 1% say none of the above. So lots of BD, lots of marketing, and lots of integrated uh, roles. Um, brilliant, thank you very much for that input. That's useful context, I think. So let's now come to our panel for the first of our questions. And we'll start at the, uh, the top of the, uh, the planning process with strategy, please. Now, strategy obviously means different things to different people. In professional services, for me, some of the common uh, threads around strategy are that it tends to be a long-term planning tool. It tends to be often highly political, and it, it clearly requires a great deal of effort to network with and build relationships with stakeholders. So in that context, I'd like to ask the panel, what has the impact of lockdown been on your firm's BD and marketing strategy? So the impact of lockdown on your firm's BD and marketing strategy. So let's start please with Amanda. Amanda, what's the impact of lockdown for you? I think as soon as lockdown down happened, I would say that it was a case of putting your mask on before you put the mask on of those around you, which is to get yourself in shape as soon as possible to be able to deal with this. And then I have to say that in terms of long-term strategy, because nobody really knew how this was going to play out over a long period of time, it was very much looking at what do we do right here and right now for our clients. And in terms of law firms, um, as we all know, there was a huge amount of legislative changes that happened fairly quickly. For example, furlough, there were other things that happened very quickly, like the courts immediately going to virtual court hearings, which was a huge thing for our business because we're 70% litigation. And also the regulators were talking about how they were going to be coping with it. So the CMA immediately put out an announcement saying that it was carrying on as business as usual. So I think the first thing we really wanted to do was to get all that content out to our clients to say, look, this is what is going to be happening in your world very quickly. Now, uh, we all know that every other law firm was doing exactly the same as that. So there had to be an extent to which we wanted to really reach out to our clients at a bit more of a personal level. So we sent a lot of personalised emails saying, um, we think that this may affect you, please get in contact with us, without the sort of a lot of the marketing speak and the family approach to it, which is really, it, it takes a huge amount of time, but I think we recognise that that's what we had to do. So that, that was the really sort of point one. And then secondly, it was all about staying connected with clients, showing them that we were all going through the same thing together, um, that all the issues that our employees were facing were also being faced by our clients. So it's getting that mixture right between, we understand your world at the moment, we understand what you're going through, but you need to know this. So I, I, in terms of short-term strategy, that was what we focused on immediately. Thank you very much, Amanda. Let's come to Peter at Accenture now, please. Sure. So, I mean, I think if your yeah your definition was a long term process, I, I, I would suggest our BD and marketing strategy didn't really change. I mean, the strategy remains to focus on what the brand stands for in the market, um, and then to use our relationships, in many cases existing relationships, 
with most of our clients to explain to them the story we have to tell um, and do that in a way that engages them personally and as a, as a company. So, you know, at, at that level, the strategy remained as it's always been to grow, get closer as, as a manager, so get closer to our clients, stay close to our clients, you know, be clear about why we're different and ensure that they, you know, they know how we can help. Um, and we do that as we've always done it through you know, various different things. What did change um, at two levels was the prioritization of the things we've sold to them. So the services that we, um, we, we sold to those clients that wanted to talk to those clients about changed in the way in which we, we thought about them. And then very much, which will come on to, I know when we talk about tactics, how we, how we did that engagement and how we pivoted to, 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 to grow, maintain those relationships. But in, in terms of if you take that middle bit, you know, of course we prioritized, we saw a huge, from our perspective, opportunity to remind people of the work we can do in enabling people to work remotely. So um, our technology team um, saw a huge opportunity to move um, whole corporations, including the NHS, by the way, to Microsoft Teams. We moved all of NHS Mail, which is the email system we support, um, to Microsoft Teams to enable many of the NHS staff to work remotely um, in a week. Um, so those kinds of services moved up the sort of priority list of getting focus and effort. Um, so but not just technology, workforce related consulting, um, those kind of, you know, you, you reprioritize the services you think are relevant for the clients at the particular time of the, the change and the, uh, the, the, the lockdown and the you know, furlough, etc. Um, so that happened and we did absolutely look at our service set and how we could what was relevant um, and what we wanted to talk about but over the overarching strategy you know the brand message the story the narrative the differentiation even of what we what we think makes us different that didn't change but obviously beneath that we reconfigured a number of things at speed and I would agree with Amanda the first thing we did was make sure that we were our own best case study for what was possible to make companies virtual and um, we are a half a million person business and we within a, somewhere in the range of a month moved 95% of those people, even those people delivering service to clients off um, uh, remotely to work remotely, including all of our delivery centers in India and, um, and China and Philippines all moved to deliver those services from home. Um, and so you know, we, we made ourselves our, our own best case study. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. So less of a change in strategy, more around prioritization and obviously virtual working. Thank you. Alessandra, why don't we come to you next, please? Yes, I think uh, uh, to echo a couple of things that both Amanda and Peter have said is that the, the core strategy doesn't change, but it changes how you go to market with it. And I think this is the change in focus for us. I think uh, we the couple of things that sort of happened uh, with lockdown, because we have a footprint, which means we had other jurisdictions that had already been going through lockdown, as uh, uh, jurisdictions in the West, you know, us here in Europe and people in the US went into lockdown, we had a sense of that journey. So we kind of very quickly became aware, one, that clients going through this process were potentially being quite bombarded by content from all sorts of different law firms and other professional services firms. So we really focus on trying to increase relevance. But in being mindful that we didn't know what the pandemic was going to do, we just put a very simple framework in place, which we call the 3R model. And it is resilience, um, recovery and renewal, because we wanted to be mindful that companies would go through these stages um, of the pandemic. And these stages would be potentially happening in parallel. So if you had operations in Asia and oper that were coming out of lockdown, you might be going into lockdown in places like Europe. Um, and so these stages uh, of resilience, recovery and renewal were not only potentially parallel, but also recurring. You could be coming out of uh, into a recovery stage and then have to go back into that kind of resilience mode. And we really then started to pivoting the service lines that we had to reflect the idea that we were able to help people as they were going through the multiple stages of the pandemic and potentially to parallel stages and really 
pivoted the, the, a lot of existing service lines to respond to that because at the core of this strategy is we wanted to increase the relevance of services and we wanted clients to be able to recognize in the service lines that they were responding to the very specific needs that were arising as a result of the pandemic. So I think this for us was the, the main change was the introduction of this framework to better position our service to clients. Thank you very much indeed, Alessandra. Let's move to Emma now, please. Um, and I think I'd you know, echo many of the things that have been said already. Um, we had a new managing partner step into role at the beginning of the year and little did he know as he started his uh, tenure that he was going to be dealing with a global pandemic. But I think what lockdown did was really, as he was starting to set out his strategy for the firm, it kind of accelerated and um, really emphasised the message, which was you know, around focus and around connection to clients. We're a firm with a very broad offering. Um, we have corporate clients, we have private clients. So our client base is really varied in terms of their needs. Um, so we really sort of focused on, um, a, you know, a very kind of personalized approach. Again, you know, a lot of law firms were putting a lot of content out there. We know clients were being bombarded with, with content early days. So it was really about making a kind of initial connection to clients, offering that sort of personalized approach and really listening to what their needs were. You know, again, we were trying to reshape ourselves and get ourselves, um, you know, prepared and ready to deal. And, um, and others have said, it's sort of important that you have your own ship in order in, in order to be able to give you know, advice to clients. And I think we were sort of very lucky that we were able to sort of mobilize, mobilize ourselves from home very sort of quickly. Um, and um you know and obviously tech has played a huge part in that and i think again we're sort of fortunate that, that we sort of made investments in tech um you know, earlier on and so we were able to kind of be sort of ready and running sort of quite quickly but yeah no sort of fundamental change in strategy but really just kind of accelerating and changing behaviors perhaps quicker than might normally have happened um in in sort of ordinary circumstances Thank you, Emma. Really interesting point on personalization, which perhaps we can pick up in, in tactics. Why don't we come uh, for the final response on strategy to Chris at EY, please? Of course, when you when you go last, everyone's already said what you were going to say. So I could just say absolutely nothing and just uh, basically say that everyone has said what I need to say. But I'll add a couple of things that um, I experienced. The first and we haven't really touched upon so far is budgets. I think there was much more scrutiny upon marketing budgets and business development budgets than there had been. They were all being looked at through a new uh, COVID lens as to do we need to do this now or is this something we can put off and put on the back burner for a little while. So COVID um, related publications, activities obviously went way up to the top of the, the batting order and everything else took a back seat. Whether that was right or, or wrong in hindsight, I think you know time will tell because as everyone has said, uh, clients became quite, um, should we say, almost irritated with the amount of publications they were receiving at a certain point about COVID. And there was, a, I think, a very clear tipping point beyond which um, they were saying, enough is enough, we want to get back to a BAU approach. The second point, I suppose, is that marketing and BD became much more reactive. Um, you know, when we're talking about strategy, we all think of it in terms of, you know, one to three year plans we pivoted much more to sort of not exactly throwing out the existing strategy for the year because as other speakers have said there was still the backdrop of what we we're trying to achieve but there's also a recognition that we were dealing with an entirely new situation and we had to be much more reactive than we would have been in the past so we were constantly reacting to new situations new information uh, both locally and around the world so it became much more um, a, a case of what do we need to do now, next week, and in the weeks to come, as opposed to what are we planning to do over the next three to six months, because the next three to six months, as we all know, is, is incredibly difficult to, to plan for currently. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. A uh, really good point on, on needing to have a shorter term le lens in our thinking. To summarise some of the points the panel have made, it sounds like there's been a consistency in firm strategy, but there's been quicker reaction to change in the markets, a reprioritization of the service offerings, and a great deal of focus on making sure that content and, and efforts are personalized, which obviously flows through into the tactics that are being used, which is a wonderful segue into our next question on tactics. And tactics are obviously an area that most of the, the uh, participants in today's call will be uh, very immersed in. So the question I'd like to ask the panel 
It's how have your tactics changed during the crisis? From my perspective, content and digital have become increasingly more important, but I very much like to hear your views on specifically what you've done differently over the last few months. Let's start with Alessandra, please. Yes, managed to unmute myself. So um, I think you're right, content and digital have become more important, but I think one of the things we noticed to start with was a real panic towards both, um, you know, do more content and, and uh, broadcast it more digitally. So it was a bit of a content rave. And uh, we noticed in the first two months after lockdown that uh, the number of client alerts that the business was producing increased by 68%. So I think it has become more important, but it has become more important to get it right. So going back to the point of relevance, we have been uh, doing a lot of work with the lawyers really to to use this approach in, in a way that is twofold, to, to better what we do in digital, but also to increase genuine um, personal contact, as many here, um, Amanda and Emma also highlighted, because that uh, thing that existed in between, like events and other ways to have face time with clients, uh, no longer exists. So we've been working very hard on the correct labeling of content, but also in trying to diversify the different ways to to output content client alert by the way these are, are, are notes on uh, legal commentary that lawyers produce and send to their clients on a very regular basis so that's why client alert is so i've just noticed the the question um and and with digital i think what has become really important on digital is that we stop and I, I know we've been talking as marketers about this for a very long time, the over-reliance on email communications and email marketing. But I think what this pandemic has highlighted is the real need to use digital properly and more broadly. So we are not just relying on email communication to reach out to clients and that we really unlock the, the potential of digital, but we do that with relevance. So I think this has been my kind of uh, uh, main takeaways from the period and the things we are focusing on currently. Thank you very much indeed, Alessandra. I love your phrase, content rave. Um, I'll uh, have to discuss exactly what that looks like with you later on. Um, Mr. Thomas, why don't we come to you, please, for your thoughts on tactics? Sure, and I think, yeah, it will echo a little bit of what Alessandra said. I mean, you know, we looked at the tactics in three, um, three buckets, really. I mean, there was the content. What content were we now going to produce? You know, I talked about prioritizing the services, but we also had to make sure that any content we developed was um, relevant and timely. Um, and actually, you know, back to Chris's point, you did you know, find that one of the things that this uh, pandemic has given is that the, from the very top of the house, the top of the company, it has given you a focus and a galvanizing effort to bring things together to be um, more joined up. So we developed, um, uh, you know, we developed only content that was relevant to, you know, in a COVID, COVID environment, whether it was by industry or by service. And there was an editorial team at the very top of the business that decided on what that content was going to be. And it, you know, in a sense, a lot of the frivolous stuff that I'm sure many of us have had to deal with over the years of people just generating stuff because they had nothing else to do with their weekend kind of went away and you could focus on the important things. Um, so you know, the type of content, or sorry, the nature of the content you know, was very focused um, and, and that's changed. The channel you know, inevitably changed, you know, some of it forced because you couldn't do you know, anything physical and so everything had to be um, remote in some way, shape or form. And that meant the move to, as you've all said, you know, more uh, virtual means of contact, whether that was email or uh, virtual round tables or, um, and interestingly, you know, in the very early stages, we saw quite a lot of appetite to, with, our, with our clients um, that with all of this time on their hands in, an, in their home environment, actually was easier than it's been for a long while to get them to attend a one hour webinar with you know three or four other people so we kept it small we didn't try to do hundreds of people um but those kind of things we 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 we, we had success with early on we've seen a lot of fatigue on that towards the end where people have you know a been starting to return to office but b you know if i have to do one more 
you know, Zoom call I'm at home, I may have to scream. So we had a bit of a balance of that towards the back end. Um, so there was a channel bit. The other thing, you know, um, I would say, and a bit of the final bit is context, which is all of you have talked a little bit about, you know, being over-marketed. And so we tried to make sure that we were focused and someone's asked a question about how we, you know, manage that sort of client communication to make sure people weren't flooded. You know, there was a big effort on making sure that clients were only receiving from us anyway, a certain amount of relevant material and they weren't being bombarded by every different service group. The final thing I would say though, is what we also found was that things we thought would be really difficult remotely, you know, were less difficult than we thought. So bid support as a function actually was unchecked. You know, you might've thought that sort of working on a major bid and having suddenly every element of that spread around the world um, might've been challenging, but we found actually we were able to move client orals online really quickly. Um, so an awful lot of things, well, not an awful lot, some of the things we thought would be harder to do remotely were, were a little easier than we thought, but we continue to do those things, I think is the point. You know, we have done a lot of sales support, bid support, and um, BD type activity, even though our consultants have not been walking the halls of clients, and you know, in some cases, sales pipeline has been deferred. Um, so you know, we changed the type of content, we rethought the channel mix, and we were always trying to be mindful of the client context that they were living through um, to try and make it relevant. You know, did we get it right every time? Almost certainly not. Um, but those were the three things we stack up against. Thank you, Peter. Great points on, on focus and the narrowing of channels, which I'm sure is, is something that resonates with everyone. Uh, so for the final answer to this question on tactics, can we come to Emma, please? Um, I mean, again, I would sort of echo similar comments. I think um, someone actually interesting put a question around internal comms. So actually one of our tactics was around how we communicate internally and shared initiatives, you know, again, where you're missing that kind of walking around the halls and seeing one another where we might present new initiatives in a room, finding ways that we can make uh, partners aware of kind of other activities around the firm. So um, we were sort of evolving our internet at the same time as um, developing some of our external channels as well. And then I think the second point on channels as well was just sort of challenging our teams on the ways that they were sort of delivering content. So there's a sort of temptation to take your marketing plan if you're doing a seminar, make it a webinar, when actually that isn't always sort of the right way to do it. So really kind of looking at the content and finding the best channel for that. We've had a huge uptake in podcasting, for example. Um, again, um, I think we're perhaps in a little danger of drifting into sort of quantity over quality at the moment. So um, I think we need to sort of keep a check on some of that. Um, but again, you know, what has happened is that our, our teams sort of digitized themselves very, very quickly. And in some ways you have to kind of manage that enthusiasm to make sure that you're maintaining the right quality, directing it at the right people, constantly looking at your data, reporting back on that, seeing what's working and kind of adjusting plans accordingly. And actually, where some of our kind of campaigns or initiatives might have had a much longer life in the past, we were sort of running shorter campaigns and adjusting them much quicker in response to sort of data and engagement. Thank you, Emma. Really good points about the shorter time horizons, the uh, the need to focus, and and the fact that certain channels, whilst you know very popular right now, might be becoming tired. So time for us all to to innovate. Um, we'll come to our second poll in a moment, but before we do, just a reminder for all of our audience, uh, there's a Q&A function. If you please put down any questions you'd like to have the panel answer, we'll come to uh, a full Q&A session at the end of uh, this discussion in about 25 minutes time. So can we move to our second poll now, please, which is again something I'd like to ask all the audience to participate in. And, and if you're watching this on recording, uh, you won't see the graphics, but I'll talk to it. The question is about working from home. How have you found working from home during the lockdown? You have four options. First, you can say it's positive in every way. Secondly, you can say it's efficient, but I miss the social interaction. Thirdly, you can say it was difficult overall. Or fourthly, and if you've watched the film Brewster's Millions, you'll know this, um, the option is none of the above. So positive, efficient, difficult, or none of the above. Okay, I think we have uh, pretty much all the responses in. Let's close the poll, please, and, and see what the results are. Drum roll, brilliant, thank you very much indeed. So 21% of respondents 
uh, felt that lockdown working from home was positive in every way. Over two thirds, 68% found it efficient, but they missed social interaction. And only 9% found it difficult. And finally, only 2% are from the Brewster's Millions camp and voted none of the above. So I guess the overall sense is it was pretty good, but they missed, we all missed social interaction, um, which certainly resonates with me. So thank you all for participating. Um, I think that, that point on social interaction is a great segue into our third question for the panel, which is on people. And the question is about how has the crisis impacted the teams you've managed? Um, and, you know, please tell us a little bit about the future of working from home. So the impact on your teams and the future, please. Let's start with Chris at EY. I have to put my hand up and say I was one of the 21% who are obviously socially dysfunctional and didn't really miss too many of my colleagues in the office. Um, I must admit I was spoiled when I, I, I grew up in, in law firm environments by having my own environment in terms of an, my own office and working for a, a global firm like EY where all hot desking all the time has advantages but also has one or two disadvantages with people who insist on talking very loudly or carry their food around with, with you and uh, spill it on the carpet as you're trying to walk past them. But that aside, let me sort of try and deal with the question itself. And the, the, the poll results don't really surprise me because I think from talking to my team, there was a lot more positivity about working from home than there was negativity. Um, the question actually prompted me to just to think a little bit and, and go back to, to February where um, we were asked to work from home for the first time collectively. So I can probably see three phases. The first phase was very much a, I suppose, a reactive phase where I think most of us wouldn't have envisaged we were going to be out of the office for several months. We probably thought we were going to be out of the office for you know, six, eight, maybe 10 weeks, possibly, but not long term. So there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of communication, um, both from the firm, but also I spent a lot of time talking to individuals within the team to try and find out their own personal circumstances, because I think one of the things that is obvious, but it's probably worth pointing out that not everyone's environment is the same when it comes from working from home. Um, I remember one of our partners going to a meeting with the, the Law Society and he said it dawned on them halfway through the meeting confidentiality might be an issue because not everyone lives in a mansion. I suppose that might say something about some of the partners in who are attending Law Society meetings, but not without um, not wishing to sort of incur any any wrath from partners who may be listening to this. So the, you know, the personal circumstances, the communication, making sure that everyone is OK making sure that everyone was able to work. Um, you know, the, the, the technology is one piece, but also just the working environment and making sure people were okay, generally speaking. But lots of communication. Then we sort of entered into a sort of what I call a BAU phase, which is, is pretty much now, um, where everybody accepted that we were gonna be working from home much longer term. People became used to it. People became you know, familiar with the technology, got used to using Teams, which I admit um, I wasn't used to at all before lockdown. I'm now almost an expert on actually making it work as opposed to actually using it properly, but at least I can get around it. But now I think the communication has settled down. Largely people understand we may be out for quite a considerable period longer. Um, there's still some uncertainty and there's still regular communication about what we're doing, but there's now much more a sort of a feeling of, of this may be the future. And we're probably entering almost a third phase now, which is what is this future gonna look like for our people? Um, I think every poll that you've seen says a lot of people are very comfortable about working from home more often. A lot of people see the advantages of working from home more often. Um, there is an element that says that we want to be back in the office for part of that time rather than working from home the whole time. But if you have to say, are we going to go back to pre-COVID normal where we're all in the office most of the time? I think the general feeling is probably not. So what does that mean? How are we going to work in the future? How is it going to impact upon our people? How is it going to impact upon that probably undervalued element of working in office, which is the social interaction of just being able to pop around to people and say, I was thinking of doing this, or let's go and grab coffee and have a conversation, which leads to all sorts of other you know, interesting aspects of uh, uh, some of your, your day job that you hadn't really thought about before. So what we need to do now, I suppose, is to try and make sure that our people have a line of sight, which is incredibly difficult in the current environment, but also make sure that they are comfortable with the new normal. How that new normal is going to look is going to be interesting, but there will be a new normal, undoubtedly. 
Thank you, Chris. Uh, definitely agree that uh, a new normal is in front of us. Um, and why don't we ask Amanda next, please, for her thoughts on the, uh, the situation in the future? Yeah, um, I think it's recognising, just picking up what Chris said, is the fact that the new normal may almost certainly uh, result be working from home for some of the time. And if that is the case, and I think what's interesting is that we all have different challenges from working from home. So we've got people who actually work from home full time already. It's quite a flexible working environment, but those who are trying to educate their children or have been, hopefully that will be fixed over the next few months. But also people who are living on their own as well. For, um, that's a difficult situation for people to be in and they need to stay connected. People who are uh, solo parents, that's, a, that's again quite a challenging situation. So I think it's, it's you know, anything, if we've learned anything from this is that everybody has a very different um, home environment. But I think one thing that I think we've done quite well is to stay connected over this period. So I work predominantly with the litigation team. It's enormous, but we have a weekly meeting on Zoom every single week. There are a huge number of people on that call, but they are extremely well run. And I've actually learned a huge amount more about what my litigators are up to on, on a day to day basis than I did beforehand. And it's been incredibly insightful and wonderful from that perspective. We've also tried to recreate those water cooler moments, um, which is the whole, um, what have you been doing with your weekend? And we call them team hugs. And we've had those twice a week. And that's made such a difference because we don't have to talk about work. We can just talk about, you know, did we make any banana bread over the weekend? Which of course everybody did. When, and now we've come through the next phase out of that now. I don't know what's next on the baking list. But talking about all of those things, and I've actually got to know people so much better because we've made time to, to get together and chat about all of those things. Um, undoubtedly we're going to have more of a culture of working from home and what's been really interesting for us is that while within the brand's marketing and sales department that's very common anyway and we have one Fiona who does it permanently, it's not so common within the lawyer teams and the lawyer teams um, I think there's been more resistance to that. But because productivity has gone up over this period, there's no question that it's going to be something that's going to be continued um, and for uh, how long, I don't know. Um, but I think that's been a massive, massive positive that's come out of it. Thank you very much, Amanda. I mean, I certainly agree that the water cooler moments have been uh, missing from my day to day, um, but I've very much enjoyed this kind of interaction digitally. Um, why don't we come to Peter now for any thoughts you have, please, on, on this issue? Sure. I mean, I think, yeah, we, a bit like EY, I guess, started from a position of being a very, very virtual organisation. When you join Accenture, you largely get a laptop, a rucksack and a phone. Uh, no desk, no, you know, no, oh, and a locker. But you don't get a desk, you don't get an office. So, yeah, we were very virtual and I personally you know, work from home quite a lot of the time because if I wasn't travelling, I'd tend to work at home. But even I have found that a challenge over a long period. And I think, as everyone said, you know, the challenge has been to engage all of your people effectively while they realize that this is not just a passing phase it is going to be a you know a reality for many of us for a while to come yet um a lot of effort in the early stages on engagement you know i think chris probably missed out the novelty stage i noticed there was a there was about a month phase where we all worked out how to do personal backgrounds on teams and everybody had worked out how to raise their hand and you know and now, you know, now that's gone away because, frankly, you know, we're just focused on sort of, you know, trying to do the best we can. Um, so, so I think there, you know, um, you know, the, the, there is just a big change coming. I think the only thing, so I would agree with what everyone said, but what I, what I was going to add to, I think one of the dichotomies we're going to have to deal with as leaders, maybe, of people and teams is a lot of the emphasis, a lot of people who might want to come back will be those people who are, flat shares working around their kitchen table with three other people from other companies who really desperately want to get in the office who but who are naturally probably more junior um, and they will be the ones who want to get back in the office but the leaders would might be the ones that want prefer to not be in the office because they have an environment where they have an enclosed office and high-speed internet and all of those things so you know there is a risk you end up with a bulk of the mid middle tier of your pyramid back in the office and you know that will force leaders to be back in because you've got to be there to lead your teams. And I, I just think that there may be different leadership styles that will have to emerge as we deal with a dynamic of, you know, what your team wants versus what you want. Whereas in the past, you know, that, that could be the same thing. You know, I do think, you know, this is here though, as everyone said, 
for the medium to long term. Um, I don't think that's purely going to be about real estate costs, although I think for many companies that will come into the equation. I do think it is a, you know, a comment on lifestyle for many, which is, as Amanda said, you know, productivity is possible. We do have this concept in a global organization like Accenture of the Internet Day, which is now the problem is now you're at home. There is no cutoff point where you leave the office and travel and break the day up. You know, the many times because you could be on calls till nine o'clock at night, not even notice you haven't left your desk for 10 hours, uh, which is not always healthy. So there's a whole lifestyle ad adaption to go. Uh, but I think for many of us, you know, particularly of a certain sort of, um, you know, family orientation or whatever situation, you know, the idea that you get to spend more time with your family, you know, um, is, is attractive. So I do think there will be a change in the workforce dynamic for our teams as much as all of our companies that we're going to have to deal with. Um, but I do expect this to be here for a while and I do expect it to be about far more than technology. Technology proved it's possible. You know, um, culture will have to prove whether it's desirable. And that's something we as leaders are going to have to work, work on quite hard, I think. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. And thank you to everyone who's answered that question. Uh, I mean, the points to me about needing to be cognizant of people's different personal situations and personal preferences, I think are very important. And, you know, as leaders, we need to consider those in, in planning for the future. Um, so why don't we move on to our penultimate question for the panel, which is about what people have learnt over the past few months. I personally learnt a great deal about human nature, which ties into the, the comments made a few moments ago about economics and also about tactics that work for marketing in a crisis. So the question I'd like to ask the panel is, what has been your biggest personal learning from the crisis? And to follow up on that, what would you do differently? And what have you seen others do that you thought was great? So your biggest personal learning, what would you do differently? And what would you copy from someone else? Why don't we start with Emma on that question, please? Um, I think sort of one of the uh, sort of initial learnings is at the beginning of, of all this was a sort of need to sort of react very quickly and um, not being afraid to sort of take time, kind of consider your options, consider your team uh, and your position before you kind of prepare your response. Um, and, you know, and on, on, in that response, I mean, allowing sort of flexibility, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we have a very varied client base here and we learned, um, I think, you know, quite quickly that a one size all wasn't going to fit for everybody. And while some of our business areas were digitizing or digitalizing very, very quickly, there were others where that wasn't, wasn't going to work and not being resistant to the different paces of change within the organization as well. Um, so, um, you know, I think we've all learned with this experience that you can set off on sort of one path with your sort of strategy and your, and your long-term vision, but, you know, altering that path quickly and, and frequently is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, as long as you kind of, you know, you, you kind of keep motivated and you keep clear on what your sort of ultimate goals are. Um, and then, so, sorry, the second question, second point was... Yeah, the second part of the question was, what would you do differently and or what would you seek to emulate that you've seen others do? Um, I think in terms of what we would probably do differently, I think, um, again, not being afraid to sort of challenge over sort of some, some of the sort of quick reactions to things. I think, again, we were sort of keen to get out to clients very, very quickly. And um, certainly there was an element of a need for that. Um, and, but I think sort of taking the time to sort of push back on some of, some of the ideas or, you know, being more considered about our approach. I mean, I mentioned podcasting earlier on was something that kind of got whipped up very sort of quickly within the organization. And it wasn't necessarily always the right sort of channel for delivering that particular type of content. It wasn't always necessarily done sort of in, in the sort of the best way. And we were sort of sacrificing some of our sort of quality and some of our objectives over sort of the need to get something done and get something out there. Um, and, you know, I think I've seen um, others do that sort of very, very well. And I think, you know, podcasting, I mean, I, I mentioned that just because it's something that's been quite new to our organization is, you know, something that should always have an element of entertainment to it, I believe as well. And, you know, for law firms and for lawyers, that, that can be a difficult, that's not necessarily within their natural skill set. So, you know, pushing them in another direction, which takes on something that is, um, 
is, is sort of better suited to their either their client base or their own particular sort of skill set as well. Again, sort of not going down that one size fits all approach. Thank you very much indeed, Emma. Really good point about not being one size uh, fits all. I'm conscious of time. Um, let's come to Alessandra now for your quick thoughts on this, please. Hi. So, so my thoughts on this, I think the, the, the biggest learning was really to use the crisis to our advantage. Once, once I think that the that we kind of got hold of the panic was to use the crisis to our advance to to advantage to drive quicker decision making. Law firms are notorious for uh, procrastinating and, and, and consulting. And I think that really helped us drive much quicker decision making. We need to be quick to market, otherwise this will age. You know, things are moving very quickly quickly, but also to help the business to live with the idea that we can be iterative rather than final. So it doesn't matter if this doesn't have all the answers. What we want to be doing at the moment is to be having a conversation with our clients. So that comfort that we are going to launch something that we will continue to evolve rather than launch something that is absolutely perfect. And also I think using the crisis to our advantage to, in a way, um, kill some initiatives that we were dubious about for some time. So there were things, so we looked at the way we approach, you know, I don't know, legal directories, for example, and, 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 and the time and attention we did give to that and how our overall marketing investment and really using the opportunity of budget scrutiny to rein into some aspects of that. Um, I think for me, the biggest learning and the biggest challenge is that in a time like that, a lot of the gains we've made in, in marketing and BD functions in professional for services firms don't get eroded. So I think that the, the flip side of this crisis, and I talked a bit about budget scrutiny, and I know others talked about that as well, is that we become too focused on the short term and actually forget that at some point, regardless of what happens, we, we will either normalize this pandemic and will be very quickly be absorbed in how we do business, or we're going to just move on to something else. And we need to continue to look around the corner to see what this something else is, uh, which I don't feel at the time we are, we, are, we are doing as well as we could do. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Great points. Chris, a quick comment from you, please, on your greatest learning. Probably fell, fell into two particular buckets. One is how resilient people are. Um, looking at our team, how they performed. I think we've already heard, heard a number of people say in terms of productivity, et cetera, it didn't really have very much impact at all. But also, I think learning to trust people much more than perhaps you would have done automatically. Yeah. I think we all are used to people working from home, but there's always a certain sense of how hard are they working. Um, yeah, hand on heart, I would say that sometimes you question whether people need to work from home. Um, but since the crisis, I think there's been much more trust, generally speaking, across the organization, um, which is reflected in the figures as much as anything else. So far more trust, far more acceptance that people do work hard, don't need to be in the office, and are quite resilient in terms of how they approach their work. I think we'll see sort of lots written about the learnings about marketing generally during this, this COVID uh, period. And we are, we're all familiar with some of the, the disaster stories of, of people putting, uh, should we say profits ahead of people and the, the impact that's had on their businesses in terms of profile and public perception. I think the one thing that it has underlined is the need to talk to people. Clients want, wanted and still do to talk to their advisors. Um, there's been an awful lot of push marketing in terms of content and emails and telling clients what they need to do. I think what's, I, I remember seeing a, a figure in the, the lawyer that said something like 25% of clients, uh, GC clients had not been contacted by the legal advisor in a meaningful way since the, the start of the crisis. Clients really wanted to talk and really wanted to just exchange views. And I think there was far too much. And I think we probably put ourselves in that same category of pushing stuff out to them rather than picking up the phone to them and saying, what do you need? Or just perhaps a conversation about, clients often wanted to find out what, other, what their peers were doing. Um, so I think there was a certain amount of, we need to do things quickly, we need to send stuff out, we need to react. But you know, the biggest potential learning from that is that at the end of the day, the clients really want to talk to you and really want to listen 
to what your clients want to, 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 to discuss rather than just push things to them the whole time. Thank you, uh, Chris. Great points on pull rather than push. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Amanda, any final thoughts from you, please, on your greatest learning? Yeah, sure. I think greatest learning is that empathy is the key to marketing during all of this time and that our clients are all people in the same way that we're all people and they're going through exactly the same things that we're all going through. So um, that's why the email blast sometimes um, wouldn't be well received. Not only are they getting thousands of emails, but they're getting ones that don't look as if um, this organisation understands what they're going through. Uh, it's a very, very difficult balance to strike, um, as is the balance between business as usual, the stuff that they still need to go, things that are still happening despite the COVID crisis, um, and things that uh, they need to they need to know because that's part of the COVID crisis, if you see what I mean. So legal developments, um, but also things that are out of the crisis, I think that balance has been extremely tricky. The other thing I think that I probably would have liked to see more of is, the, is that all of these large organisations are dealing with this themselves, the same way that their clients are. How are these organisations dealing with working from home? How are they dealing with furloughing employees if they are furloughing them? And sharing that with our clients. I think that's something that would have been, I mean, maybe it has been going on, and if it has, I haven't seen it, but I think I would as a client i probably would like to see more of that thank you amanda great points particularly the point about empathy which i think is a core skill for marketers to uh, to have and to embed in their organizations we are running short of time so let's skip straight to the the final poll please which is around career aspirations so if we could have that up on screen please we'd like to everyone to very quickly tell us what are your aspirations? You've got five choices. You can say you'd like promotion in your current firm. You could say you'd like to move firms for promotion and obviously Kartamari will be rubbing their hands at that, uh, that opportunity. You could say move firms for the same level, move firms for a different function, or you could say you are happy as you are. Okay, can we close the poll please? And I'll quickly summarize the answers which are coming on screen now. Uh, so 25% are looking to be promoted in the current firm, 42% would like to move for promotion and 22% would like to move for the same level. Only 3% looking to move firms for a different function and 8% happy as they are. So two thirds of people looking to move. Very conscious of time. Can I ask the panel now for one quick pithy final thought on what people need to do to advance their careers. So the one uh, fantastic idea you can offer to people about how to move their careers forward. And let's start please for the final answer with Peter. Um, well, I'm not gonna say make it pithy, it's three things. Be curious, be relevant, be connected. There we are. Brilliant, and uh, that was pithy. Thank you very much, <laughs> Alessandra. Uh, flexible. Be flexible and be adaptable. Uh, be prepared to go beyond your your job role. Great flexibility, Chris. Take calculated risks. Don't be afraid to fail. We all fail, uh, but if you try and do what's gone before, you're not going to get anywhere. Great. Take risks. Absolutely. Thank you. And Amanda, please. Get under the skin of the areas that you support within the business and talk the talk. So don't say country. Say jurisdiction let's say cash say liquidity and you'll get immediate respect from your lawyers because it sounds like you know what you're talking about and for certain you know and you do but you just need to sound like you do thank you so speaking the language of your market great and finally emma uh, i just echo the flexibility point don't be fixated on having a five-year or ten-year plan just regularly check in on yourself and um, be prepared to sort of adjust um, as the environment adjusts around you Great, thank you all. So flexibility, take risks and speak in the language of your clients as well as being pithy in, in the way that you answer questions on webinars are clearly the secrets of success in, in your career. I'm conscious of time, we have about four minutes to respond to questions from the panel, uh, from the audience rather. Let's start with the question that came in from Eleanor, please. Uh, why don't I ask Amanda to answer this one? The question is, how have you encouraged fee earners to contact clients without it being seen as ambulance chasing? 
Great question, Eleanor. Um, I'm right in that business. My firm focuses on litigation and insurance. Um, we couldn't be better fitted for this type of crisis. And I think in that situation, you just have to show that you're there um, and show that you and just remind people in the market that you do this type of work without appearing to ambulance chase. So continue doing what you're doing, but make sure that it's completely focused um, on the here and now. Uh, don't try and oversell, just carry on doing what you're doing, make sure that you send personalised content. Great, thank you. So personalisation is key. A uh, question from Dominic Ayres. Each of your firms, um, when they've looked at tactics, how have you continued to monitor return on engagement against objectives? Or has this been an afterthought? I'm going to ask for a volunteer from the panel to comment on measuring ROI. Well, I mean, I'm happy to say something if it helps. I mean, the truth is, you know, as many of us have outlined, one thing that did happen during this pandemic is a huge amount, in fact, or not all marketing moved online. So the good news is that online gives you access to metrics that enables you to tweak and um, improve your programs on a dynamic basis. So actually, I would imagine all monitored the ROI even more closely than we could in the past because we were able to and because most of it was available to us at the, at the, as long as you have the right analytics tools at the, uh, at the push of a button. So yes, for us, everything from client engagement, click-through rates and uh, dwell time, all the way through to impact on sales and you know, actual pipeline um, have suddenly become much more visible and that's a good thing. Thank you, Peter. So actually digital makes things easier. I will, uh, I will take that on board. Um, question from Sue. Warner, what do we think about BD functions being offshored, which is possibly a controversial question. Would anyone like to, to pick up the, uh, the topic of offshoring BD functions? Alessandra has a hand up. Go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. I'd like to comment on that because there's been obviously a, a movement. I don't know, obviously, the big four have done it for a while. We are a large global organization. We have four different centers. Um, I think that, yes, on one hand, the pandemic has shown that you don't need that physical presence as much as you do, but what you do need to do, your uh, job is a connection. So, you know, some we talked about being resilient and being productive, and part of the reason why I think we've held on to productivity in a number of teams is that connection and relationships have already existed. So I think what we need to be careful there is to not offshore uh, activities at the expense of that connection with the business because that's where idea generation comes from. But on the other hand, it means that we are possibly less restricted than we were before. And I think the other danger of uh, um, offshoring initiatives and why we need to be careful with this term so that we don't transform BD and marketing to a back office operation. I think we really need to transform how we talk about centers within professional services firms uh, because um, depending on how we talk about it, it could be to our own detriment. Thank you very much indeed, Alessandra. Great answer. It's absolutely important. I'm sure we'd all agree that marketing BD and comms is not seen as a back office function and that we're there to help the business understand the market, adapt to the market and, and do their best in these very difficult times. I'm afraid we are out of time to take any further questions. So I would just like to conclude and, and thank you to this wonderful panel, to Chris, to Emma, to Amanda, to Alessandra and to Peter. I've certainly learned a lot from this discussion and I'd also like to thank Carlton Murray and Hannah for the invitation. Hannah, back to you. Thank you, Leo, and um, I'd like to thank you as well for, for leading that and moderating today. It's been fantastic. And, and, and again, to the panel, just to reiterate, we sort of said they're so inspiring for all of us listening in, but also for uh, the fact that we recorded it, that's, that's great as well, because we can then share that to those who haven't had the time to, to, to log in today. Um, and we've only just touched on the surface of the insight from you as well. So again, thank you so much. And um, again, we've been so lucky to have you all, but um, feel free to, to send further questions through 
everybody will be able to take those on and feedback from today um, we will then be able to, to pop those to the panel and then we can sort of uh, yeah just to disseminate that out um, over uh, LinkedIn or yeah through our website um, but again thank you everyone for joining today and for, for Leo again and the panelists uh, we look forward to joining for you joining us in the future and uh, enjoy your day goodbye